Go ahead. All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second in our EMX seminar series, uh, which happens to be the last one of this uh, historic uh, year of uh, 2020. As you know, the intent of these meetings is to provide excellent talks based on electron microscopy uh, to a wide uh, audience, broad audience, and uh, using both the uh, bio and the physical sciences uh, as the platform. So today we have uh, Sir Richard Henderson and Professor Francis Ross, uh, who will make the presentations. And uh, we have set up for January 4th will be the next one, the first Monday of the month, the first Monday of the new year. And Joaquin Frank and uh, Jen Dion will be our speakers on that day. Meanwhile, I'd like to thank uh, my co-organizers, uh, uh, Wa and uh, Yi and, and Jen, uh, and of, uh, most of all, our helpers uh, here, Raphael and uh, Ziwen and uh, Yichen and Yunji, who have uh, provided the infrastructure for uh, these, uh, this seminar series. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, Wa Chu, who will uh, moderate the talk by uh, Richard Henderson. Wa? Thank you, Bob. Good morning, everyone. It's my great honor today to introduce Richard Henderson from the Medical Research Council's Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, United Kingdom. I personally have known Richard for almost four decades, and I have the privilege of spending a year sabbatical in his laboratory in the mid 80s. He was an excellent host. He taught me a lot about protein electron crystallography, and he also kept me entertaining so I can feel comfortable at home. In the field of cryo EM, Richard has been regarded for years as the authority to define the bottlenecks of cryo EM methodology, find the practical solution to the technical hurdles, ensure the community to get the cryo EM structure correct, and predict what it would take to achieve the ultimate resolution of cryo EM structure determinations. In the fall of 2017, all of us at Stanford were so excited and happy to hear that Richard won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which he shared with Joachim Frank and Jacques Dubuchet. Today, Richard is going to tell us about his current effort in making a new cryo EM instrument, which is based on sound physics principle and simultaneously can make it to be affordable in the academic laboratory across the globe. Let us welcome Nobel laureate Richard Henderson. Great, thank you, Wa. Um, and let me do share and project. Right. So hopefully you can see and hear um, me talking. And please, if that doesn't turn out to be true, just interrupt and let me know. So yes, yeah, so today I'm going to uh, chat to you a little bit about uh, how it looks like uh, we will be doing in CryoEM when we go forward into the future. But uh, rather than just telling you that, I think it's very instructive and useful to ask how did we get here in the first place? Because uh, not all of the things that we thought were important uh, during the development of the CryoEM methodology have turned out to be, you know, they were all uh, our best ideas at the time, but some of them are absolutely true and absolutely needed and others turns out are not required before. So uh, let me just jump in. So, you know, it's only half an hour. Uh, here is on the next slide some um, structures that we did at LMB in Cambridge after uh, my own background doing 
crystallography, both X-ray and, and electron uh, crystallography, we decided from about 1995, we would focus because of the potential of it on single particle cryo-M in solution without crystals. And these were various structures that different people in the lab have done. So if we go back to possibly the earliest one in the bottom left, uh, Guy Vigers was a student here in Cambridge with Linda Amos and I, but when he went to Jacques Dubochet's cryo-EM course, he came back and said, uh, I resign from the project Linda and I had given him. And he, he did then cryo-EM with Tony Crowther and Barbara Pierce. And this was a 45 angstrom resolution structure of the Clathrin um, cages done about 1985. It was a, probably, there were only three structures done by uh, this type of cryo-EM at that time. Uh, uh, there was uh, a virus that Jacques Dubois had done, Semliki forest virus. There was a T4 phage tail by Jean Le Paul and this one by Guy Vigers. And, and it was lovely structures, but very blobby. Corin Smith then improved it to about 20 angstrom resolution in 1997. And now, of course, we have much better structures of clathrin cages from Alex Fortin at, uh, with, with Nico in, in the Harvard, Boston area. And then uh, Corin Smith now, who uh, was the first author of that paper, now has a four angstrom structure. Beta galactosidase, we tried very hard to work on back in 1997, but this was the first map that we thought was truly believable. It was done on film in the year 2011. Um, this is pyruvate dehydrogenase from Peter Rosenthal's work, nine angstrom resolution. Uh, Nico, when he was writing um, the first version of Free Align, focused on mitochondrial complex one. I'll come back to that again. That was 20, 22 angstrom resolution. Kyung Hee Ri, 15 angstroms. And then the very first um, F type ATP is from John Rubinstein's work when he was a student and then a postdoc for about a year, 30 angstrom resolution. So this is, these were all blobby structures and they were all 10, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but it was clear it was going to work, but it needed a lot of developments to be made. So then I'd like to jump right up to the present day and show you two or three structures uh, that represent where we are now and pull out the best points of the cryo-EM so that you can get a, a feeling for that. So the next one is, is actually my favorite structure because it shows all of the things that are so good and so powerful about single particle cryo-EM. This is work that uh, Alexi Amunz did when he was a postdoc with uh, Venki Ramakrishnan trying to make crystals of mitochondrial ribosomes, which could never be purified because of contaminating cytoplasmic ribosomes. He worked together with uh, Xiao Chen Bai, who's now in Dallas, and Shaw Sherez, and took pictures like this, processed them with rely on that had just been written as uh, an average of all the structures in, in that image. But then with this 3D classification that's also been part of Reliant and which Shores had developed earlier in XMINT, they were able to separate it so that you got the, uh, the mitochondrial ribosome separated from the cytoplasmic ones and the, the full subunit separated from the large subunits. And then they could refine on part of the structure so that if there's flexibility, the ratcheting that Joachim was the first to observe could be eliminated by getting sharp view of the bit you were focusing on, the large subunit and the small subunit, and ended up with maps really like this, with the double helical uh, RNA double helix, uh, top view, uh, alpha helices with side chains, beta, beta loops, and, and nice side chains. So this shows, you know, not the need for not for purity, not for homogeneity of conformation, and really good, good resolution. And then the second example is this is mitochondrial, bovine mitochondrial complex one. This is this exactly the same structure that Nico had tried very hard to work on in 1997, got a 22 angstrom map uh, with the new equipment that came in around 2013. Uh, this is a sample that um, Judy Hurst brought over and Vinoth Kumar took this picture of about 2013. This was the map they got within a month or so, um, five angstrom map, uh, eight iron sulfur com complexes at high contour level, uh, 76 transmembrane helices, all nicely visible. They went and then had a detergent belt because it's a membrane protein. And then with a bit more work, 
they finally got a four angstrom map where they could find all 45 subunits, identify them, build a model. And this, this had been trying to do for years and years. Um, and then, of course, this um, people have, many people now have worked on this different types of, of complex one bacteria chloroplast. But the most recent paper is work done by Leo Sasanoff's group in, in Vienna. And you can see there are, there are only two authors to this paper. Presumably the person who did it and Leo supervised it. And this is a, now a two and a half angstrom structure. And they got it in five different states with different redox states. And they now have a hypothesis for how the, the, the electron transfer energy is translated into proton pumping energy. So these are two great examples of the power of the method nowadays. And then just a couple more. The next slide then shows a recent paper and it it's, from work partly done at the LMB uh, on uh, apoferritin using all the Thermo Fisher's new gadgets, uh, reaching a, a 1.2 angstrom resolution on ferritin. But others, for example, um, Holger Stark's group uh, using a slightly different electron optics, and then Wa's group at Stanford also have very similar structures, all at 1.2, 1.3 angstrom resolution. So not only can you do flexible big structures, but you can do high resolution on smaller structures. And then my last example, because we're in this coronavirus lockdown situation at the moment, uh, here is a picture that's not yet published from work that Katerina Naidenova and a group here in Cambridge did on one of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, molecules of interest in RNA polymerase that they might be trying to find um, uh, a ligand to, to inhibit it with. And that's the, these are these new gold grids with small holes and the structure and the map that should come out quite soon. So that gives you a, a, a quick idea of where we are now. And um, taking an overview of the field, another way of looking at it is how well are we doing in terms of the volume of work? And so let me just get back here. Um, yeah, so here is now the complete statistics of um, macromolecular structures uh, determined anywhere in the world over the last 50 years and so on. And it turns out there's now 172,000 structures deposited in the protein data bank, uh, most of them by X-ray crystallography, but some by EM starting about 20 years ago and some by NMR. And if you look at the, the graph, Many of you will know this already. The NMR peaked about 2007 and now is used for other things rather than de novo structure determination. X-ray went up and up and up and seemed, is now plateaued around 10,000 structures per year. But the EM, which was essentially nothing on this scale, is now doubling every one year and eight months or something like that. And so one way we try to look at how cryo-EM is developing and what are the things we need to invest in now is to look at the ratio of structures determined by X-ray divided by those by cryo-EM done per annum. And I have to move this picture aside. So um, you can see in the year 2000, there was a thousand or 2000 times more structures determined each year that gave you atomic models by X-ray than by EM. And then as the uh, field emission guns, the microscope vacuums got better. It dropped to about 200 to one. And then in 2013, when the new detectors came in, uh, it was about, uh, started to drop. And then on a log plot, it's now down, it's around four and a half times as many structures per annum. And the reason that last point is slightly off the line is because it's not the end of the year yet. And at the beginning of the year, if you took the January and February, it would be at the same point as this. So this, this is coming down a little bit. And the last thing we like to do is to put this line on, which is the extrapolation when we have parity with X-ray crystallography. That's mid-2024. But the thing that's missing here is some of the structures done by CryEM are, are impossible. You never get crystals. And the other thing is they're on average, they're six or eight times bigger so it's already worldwide in terms of residues per year, it's already a lot more productive, but the, res the resolution you get typically, particularly with the new synchrotrons with X-ray crystallography, it still is higher. So I think a lot of the, the drug designers and doing structure-based drug design still have a marginal preference for X-ray crystallography, but with further improvements, it should get on, 
uh, really quite well. So that's where we are. So how did we get here? And let me let me see if I can get rid of this. Um, yeah. Uh, how did we get here and what were the rate limiting steps in the past? And this is useful because it tells you what you should be looking for in the future. So the, the, the real killer back in the 1980s was that the microscopes had a bad vacuum. And I know Nigel Unwin, for example, and other people tried to cool the specimens in 1970. And as soon as you got down below the temperature of about minus 100, very rapidly, your specimen got covered with ice, the beam didn't come through and you couldn't do anything. Bob Glazer and Ken Downing in 1974 and 75 worked on uh, ice embedded crystals of catalase, but they had to limit themselves to minus 100 uh, because that the, was the temperature where you got um, the, the frozen ice would lyophilize at the same rate it was being deposited, but you couldn't go below minus 100. And the ice was always crystalline in those, except inside the catalase crystals. So the, the, the better vacuums came in in 1980 in this Philips um, EM400 microscope. And Jacques Dubochet was one of the first people to use them. And they had a better vacuum because the material scientists wanted a better vacuum. Then as soon as that happened, it turned out the cold stages were the limitation. They gave you uh, seven or 10 angstrom resolution because of vibrations and drift. And I'll show you some pictures of those old cold stages in a minute. Then we were using film. And if it turns out until 2012, still film still had a better DQE than any of the electronic detectors, mainly because of backscatter. Um, and, and although CCDs came in in the mid 1970s and were very convenient, instead of having to develop, fix, dry, scan, you could see your image and that gave you an advantage in terms of judging your specimen, but still we needed the new detectors to come. And then I remember we all had tungsten filaments and you had to take pictures close to focus. Field emission guns came in uh, with Hitachi, they were the first. Um, and I remember we bought a new microscope in 1994 and we got um, quotations from Jael, um, Philips and Hitachi, but Hitachi were the only ones with a good microscope. And so we bought one and we, we had a big advantage because we were the only people with a field emission gun and a microscope that really worked quite well at that point. Then of course, later on, uh, Thermo Fisher brought it in about 1996. And then we did used to think because of charging that um, higher electron energy is good. And I'll come back to that again. And so that uh, was another uh, uh, innovation that uh, was at the time we thought quite important. Uh, people even had 400 KB and then they would back off to 300. But eventually around about the beginning of the 2000s, uh, we realized the detectors were, were needed to be better. And we found a group uh, others were working on it as well uh, at Rutherford Appleton Lab at, uh, near the Harwell site in Oxford, who were experts in developing these CMOS detectors. It was being used for optical microscopy, looking at stars. And we, we tried one here and it looked very good, but it took uh, some eight or nine years to develop it. And it was when these detectors came in uh, and also with the ability to do movies that, that helped a lot in giving you better images. And then Werner wrote this very nice review and we said, oh, this is a very bad title, The Resolution Revolution, but it really has caught on actually. And so we now talk about the Resolution Revolution having started in 2014 from lots of things, uh, 300 KV backed in CMOS detectors with a fast readout gave you movies as well as the high DQE. And then of course the columns had got better and particularly the Krios now you could take uh, one minute exposures um, rather than one or two second exposures. And they've had other things that have been advocated as being important, constant power lenses, triple condenser, parallel illumination, fringe-free imaging and so on. These have all helped to make it easier for the user to get uh, images. And then against this background, uh, all the people writing computer software have had uh, constant innovations. So for example, um, Steve Ludke with Eman 1 and Eman 2 opened it up to all the people who were not experts uh, by making it 
uh, easy, simple, and it really worked well, particularly his 3D initial models worked out well. And then Nico's free line, which has been gradually improved, now system. And then Shores, with his training working on XMIP, developed Relyon around 2011, 2012. And that's become very popular because uh, indeed, it's a step-by-step -step procedure. You don't really need to know. It's like a black box, but you can know more as well. And then on the back of that, other systems, CryoSpark. And of course, I didn't mention, but very important for the years before that, Imagic and Spider created the, um, the, the network of people that were focused on developing the methods and were happy enough using them in the beginning, but now the other systems are more convenient. And there have been um, evolutions of the earlier systems in the form of Sparks and Spire. And then automation, which many people were skeptical about, seems to have made a big difference now in that people are collecting sometimes 10, 20, 30,000 images. And then you only need one or two particles on each image, you can still get the structure. The, the downside is the microscopes have now gone from being uh, the one we bought, I remember in 1980, was a EM400, the first one, the same as Dubosche had. It was, it was 100,000 pounds. In modern money, that's 400,000. But the new microscopes cost 10 times as much as they did in, in, in real money in 1980. So that's uh, one way out. Okay, so a couple of other things. Um, I have to read my. Um, that is a picture of the various cold stages that we've been involved with in Cambridge. On the bottom left here is the original styrofoam cold stage that was bought about 1962 and worked in a Philips 301, but didn't, uh, you couldn't get it very cold because of ice contamination. But that is the stage, exactly the same one that Jacques Dubochet and his colleagues used in their early demonstration of uh, plunge freezing and cryo-EM in the 90, early 1980s. These ones here were ones we developed in Cambridge. This was homemade, homemade. That was the first one made by a company called Hexland. It was then bought by Oxford Instruments. It became the CT3500, which was sold until very recently by Gatan. And then in the background are all the Gatan side entry stages. This silver one was one Nigel Unwin was involved with, involved with developing with Peter Swan at Gatan uh, in the 1980s when he was at Stanford. And these are three that are still in use today, two Gatan ones and one from Ficcioni. And so that was uh, one of the uh, stumbling points in the development of the methodology. Um, about four years ago, and this is now coming to the sort of crux of the matter in the talk, um, Vinoth Kumar, Vinoth now in um, Bangalore in India, running uh, Indian CryoM uh, national facility, we wrote a review in Quarter Reviews of Biophysics about all sorts of interesting issues, but I thought it was very important, and this was uh, section five of that review, the need for affordable cryo-EM. And the reason that we put that in is by then, we had two CREOSs in Cambridge, and the, the queue, the booking list, was two months long. So in 2012, we had our own microscope, we could get on it every day, but by 2015, because of the popularity and the success of the method, we, we had to wait eight weeks to get our one day of time on the modern microscopes. So what we said that it's fine to have national or international facilities, but when you're working on a real genuine problem that's difficult, you need daily access to your own microscope facility. And we couldn't see any way of doing that uh, without getting an inexpensive one that everybody could have of their own. Um, so the idea was, you know, you ought to be able to get structures of 150,000. Uh, you need a field emission gun to be able to get higher defocus and see that they were working. So that we said the field desperately needs an inexpensive diagnostic cryo-EM so that you could do lots more work and be much more productive. And at the very bottom, we guessed that 100 kV would be a good way of making it cheap, uh, but it would need a field emission gun and the detector optimized for 100 kV, whereas all the uh, electron counting CMOS detectors until that point were small pixel, back thin, suitable for high voltage, but not for low voltage. So that's what we said um, in 2015, 2016, 
um, but we were focused only on it being inexpensive. But after that, uh, Chris Russo and I got talking about uh, how to do this at low voltage. And we looked at some of the older literature and it turned out that if you look at the elastic and inelastic cross sections for electron scattering by anything, um, there is um, a, a, an increase in cross section as you go to lower voltage as the electrons get slower, but the ratio between elastic and inelastic is not exactly parallel. In other words, it's not, it's largely neutral. And we said it's more or less the same, 100 kV and 300 kV, but it turns out it's not exactly the same. And these theories from Loche and Betty, who, who won the Bell Prizes for different work, in their theories, um, there was a, a significant advantage by going to 100 kV. And we said, oh, well, we don't believe this. These are very old papers, 60 years old. So we thought we'd better me measure it. And that's this paper uh, with Matthew Peet having done most of the work where we measured the elastic cross section, the inelastic cross section. And then the question was, does inelastic cross section equate directly to radiation damage? So we also measured radiation damage. And it turns out the, the old theories are more or less correct. And so these are the, these are the, the graphs. So sigma i is the inelastic cross section. Sigma E is the elastic cross section. And this is the 100 to 300 kV region. And then at higher voltage, actually the inelastic goes up and the elastic becomes parallel. And if you plot the ratio, it gets better at low voltage. But of course, with a specimen of ice, you lose, if it gets too thick, you lose electrons. So these dot, dashed lines here are information content in the image worked out by multiplying the number of electrons that you get in transmission should have an I in it, sorry, um, multiplied by the elastic divided by the elastic. And for a 300 angstrom specimen, most single particles, turns out you get a, a, a graph with a peak and the peak is at 100 kV. If it's a thicker specimen, the peak is at 300 kV, but usually with thick specimens, it's big viruses, you don't worry, worry so much about it. So that was the theory. Um, but then we thought that um, we ought to prove that this was true in practice. So these were the arguments we were using. Um, we wanted to de democratize single particles. So everybody, however poor, could do it. Uh, we've done this theory, looking at the old theory. We did experiments to measure the elastic experiments. I'm not showing the radiation damage, but that followed quite well. It looked like there would be about 25 to 30% advantage at 100 kV or 300. So, so in other words, our original idea of it, that it would be useful to do only because it's cheap, but it turns out not only is it cheap, but it's also uh, better in terms of the information out to a certain resolution. And these two papers now, one by Matthew Pete et al on radiation damage and cross sections, and one with half a dozen structures uh, done also last year, th those are now published. And so the question now is, how do we translate this uh, theory and practice proof of principle into reality so that you can, so everybody can buy one. And so the, the idea was to get a system that allowed you to have a 100 kV microscope with a field emission gun and a new detector that would be wor working well at high voltage. And the question was, where should we get the money from? And in the end, we've got a grant now, in our case, uh, from Wellcome Trust uh, and some money also from uh, uh, two companies, Astex and AstraZeneca in Cambridge. And so we now have our own in-house plan to develop this a bit further. But I'm just going to show you what was in this second paper by Nidenover before I wind up. Um, but before I do that, one question people ask is, are, are we saying that you only need 300 kV? And the answer is no, because 300 kV high voltage microscopes that we've now got two or 200 or so in the world all running nicely, some of them in national centers like the ones in, in Stanford and so on. Uh, they are better um, when your um, specimen is very thick. Um, that probably won't matter for single particle EM because viruses, um, you know, a, a thousand angstrom virus at 100 kV, you can probably do quite well. 
even though it would be slightly better at 300 kb because it's so big and you can determine the orientation so accurately. But for electron cryotomography, um, you've got this twofold advantage in scattering, um, reduction, reduction in scattering, one and a half fold in the inelastic. And so you do get, so I think uh, for tomography, it's always going to be true. People will prefer 300 kb. Um, but there is another thing, and that is um, with the envelope function, uh, the chromatic um, uh, temporal coherence function, the ratio of the energy spread of your electron source to the energy, delta E over E, is three times better at 100 kb if you have the same source. So the envelope function on resolution, that threefold uh, ratio translates into a root three improvement in resolution. So if you can get, say, two angstrom resolution by uh, at, at, at a 100 kb, you'd be able to get 1.2 as people are doing with 300 kb. Although there are other ways of getting around that, you can have monochromators and so on. So that was the, so here are now some structures. This is what we did using um, uh, an FEI F20 microscope turned down to 100 kb with this Dectris Iger, and it's only half a megapixel, so 32 times less area, and it has eight of these A6, 256 square. That's an image of um, April ferritin, and if, after you do the bright and dark field correction, the image looks quite nice, and these are the structures that were done uh, with about a week of time. Um, this was uh, E. coli 70S ribosome at about seven or eight angstrom resolution, this was um, uh, catalase, it's hiding behind my sign here, at about six or seven angstrom resolution. Uh, this was um, uh, hepatitis B, the same structure Bettina Boccia did in 1997, first sub nanometer structure at about uh, nine angstroms also. Uh, this was DPS that was the one that came out best, 3.4 angstroms. It's, it's half the size of ferritin, has the same alpha helical structure. You can see the alpha helix here. You can be, begin to see side chains. And then the last one was uh, hemoglobin. It wasn't done very uh, high resolution, but, but it, you, know, you, you could get it. You could get the orientation, 8.4 angstroms. So uh, that's, the, that's the story. I've got about two or three minutes left. So the question is, how going forward, how will people be able to get this? Well, fortunately, um, although um, Thermo Fisher initially said that they weren't so keen on this, uh, about uh, two or three weeks ago, they did make an announcement, and this is the Thermo Fisher launch of a Tundra, which is a fixed 100 kV uh, microscope. These are all... Um, video artist representations, computer simulations. This is the loading station. This is the transfer unit with a grid and you put it in this hole and hopefully it'll work just as nicely as their Krios and their Glacios works. And apparently you can order one of these now. Um, and then the second possibility, this is what we've been doing. Thank you. Yeah. So we bought a jail. Have a great day. See it again? I didn't hear. So that's a JL1400. It's got a dextrous detector on it. It hasn't got a field emission gun on it, but we've got these three side entry cold stages. And we're hoping that within uh, six months or so, we'll have this working nicely, collecting data and publishing papers. And then people will be able to hopefully buy one of these, either the Tundra or, or this one, 100 kV with a field emission. So with that, I'm going to finish. Uh, I've showed other people's slides as examples of the methodology, mitochondrial ribosome, uh, complex one, April ferritin and the SARS-2. And then our work in Cambridge over many years, we're still working on lots of detector projects. Uh, Greg McMullen, Wazi Faruqi, and the two people, Nicola Garinia and Renato Turchetta, who now has his own company, were very important here. And then all the work on the 100 kV uh, optimization, proof of principle and, and the pro project is done with Chris Russo and his group, particularly Katrina Naidanova and Matthew Pete. Pete. And then this uh, system I showed you, the field emission gun is being developed by a company in York, a little company, York Probe Sources. Gerald UK have been very helpful. Uh, we have a dectris detector at the moment, but there is a plan 
with funding from the Rosalind Franklin Institute and SDFC RAL to develop a CMOS that would be optimized for 100 kb. So with that uh, ending, I can stop there and uh, go back to uh, the screen. Thank you very much, Richard, for these outstanding lectures. Uh, now the question is, uh, the question uh, is open for, for the audience and you may type your questions in the Q&A. Uh, in Richard's talks, uh, he already answered some of the questions, but I would um, uh, 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 read out some of the questions and, and Richard may respond. The first question is, uh, why do we use the CMOS detector instead of CCD for cryo EM? Yeah, okay, let me answer that. So I was trying to, you know, cut things short in, in a way. So the current CMOS detectors that you buy, for example, the Falcon or the Catan K2, K3 or, or direct electron, they all have five, six or 13 micron pixels and they've been back thin, so the 300 kV electrons go straight through them, and they have really quite good point spread functions. But if you turn the voltage down to 100, the energy down to 100 kV, in order to get the advantage of this, um, uh, let's say, reduced radiation damage relative to information, the 100 kV electrons do not penetrate even the back thin detector. So you get a lot of backscattering and the DQE drops badly. So there, there are two ways around that. One is you could back thin it down to five or 10 microns, which is very difficult to do. And so far, no one has done that. And I don't know of anybody who's tried it. But the other idea is to make um, a CMOS detector with a much bigger pixel. So the one that, that uh, uh, for example, um, Nicola Garini at STFC is working on is a CMOS with a 50 or 60 micron pixel. And that will have a really superb um, DQE for 100 kV electrons. And then the, the Dectris detector is a hybrid pixel detector. It has a 75 micron pixel. And so most of the CCDs that you buy are 15 micron or 10 micron or so. But what you can do with the CCD with um, with a phosphor on it, you can bin the pixels. So you could get a 4K, for example, the, the Gatan One View or the Thermo Fisher CETA detector, you get 4K by 4K with, um, let's say, um, six or, or 14 micron pixels. You can bin them up to 40 or 50 microns, but then you're down to one megapixel of real data. And you, you do that because the DQE in these phosphors because of backscattering of the electrons is really rather poor. And so CMOS is used at high voltage um, instead of CCDs because you back thin it and the electrons go straight through. Whereas CCDs with phosphor fiber optics, you can't do that. And then at low voltage, even the back thinned are too thick. So you need either a big, big pixel or a very, very, very back thinned uh, detector. So that was hopefully a, uh, an answer to that one. Okay, thank you. Richard, there's a question from Bob Grazer. Uh, he asks, is it correct to think that it is the total specimen thickness that is important, not just the particle size? Yes, yes, that is correct. It's the total specimen thickness that's important. The ice, in other words, because it's, it turns elastic electrons into inelastic ones. And we're I mean, the initial goal that we're thinking of is it's got to be, the main goal is affordable. And then the second benefit you get that is a little bit less radiation damage. Um, so it's the overall thickness is important. Okay. But you know, if, if, the, if the reason that your specimen is thick is because you've made too much ice, you can, you can obviously blot it a bit harder and make it thinner. And even ribosomes are only 250 angstroms thick. So anything bigger than a ribosome, you obviously have to have 500 angstroms or 1,000 angstroms. And I know certainly WA has worked on some, you know, 1000 angstrom diameter viruses, but you could do these easily at 100 kb because even though you'd lose some electrons, the signal is so strong with 1000 angstrom uh, icosahedral viruses 
the, the, the advantage you'd get at 300 kV isn't worth the money. So we think for all single particle work, 100 kV is the future. And so only for tomography or very high resolution will you want the 300 kV one. So it wouldn't surprise me if, shall we say, 10 years from now, uh, people have stopped buying the 300 kV microscopes and they're buying, uh, there'll be two types of 100 kV microscopes. There'll be the really cheap one that involves a lot of manual work. And then there'll be your, uh, your let's say, Mercedes Cadillac style 100 kV, where everything is fully automated, works just as nicely as it does on the, on the Krios at the moment, but it'll be more expensive. So that's, I think the market is for 100 kV affordable and 100 kV uh, luxurious for those who are more um, endowed with cash. Okay, thank you. Somebody uh, other. Yeah, Richard, there's a question about a comparison between the uh, transfer rod holder uh, versus the auto loader uh, currently used in the Creos. Uh, is there an advantage or disadvantages? And I presume uh, the one you, you, you refer to is a transfer. I didn't say anything about that, but uh, the, the, the thing about the Creos or the cryo arm for gel, they do have uh, an auto loader, but if you want to load one grid and look at it and then find it's no good and then make another grid after you've seen the result of the first grid, it takes about an hour to load the Creos actually. By the time you've plunge freeze the grid, clip it, transfer it to the cassette, transfer it to the microscope, wait for the vacuum, get it inserted, look at the image, it takes you about an hour. Um, Whereas um, even with a side entry holder, you can do it probably in about the same amount of time. So what we've said in addition to, so uh, what I showed you was um, the Tundra will have a, a one grid system that's going to be very quick. And that was partly because it was for a screening microscope. Um, at the moment, we've got these side entry holders, which probably takes you half an hour or an hour. But we did say, a very important thing after you've got a system that works and that you can that you can buy and you know in a, a, a department or a university without much money what you want is a rapid single grid uh, cryo transfer system where you can put the grid in take a picture in five minutes or ten minutes and then get it out again um, and if it's a good grid keep it for another microscope send it to a national center or if it's a bad grid you make another one and put another one in and then every 10 or 20 minutes, you get feedback. And then within one day, you've solved all your problems. Whereas at the moment, you know, you get your one day on the microscope, you look at your grid, it's no good. And then you have to go away and make another grid and you get another day eight weeks later, unless you've got, uh, you know, Mondays are for screening or something like that. So I think we do need better, quicker and more rapid uh, cryo transfer systems and actually we, that is one of the things we're thinking of doing here as well but that the tundra was supposed to aim for that as well the one thing that the tundra will will have initially is a ccd with the phosphor fiber optic it'll be the CETA. but what we've told thermo fisher is once that's delivered and people start to buy it um they really must focus on getting a really good 100 kb detector. And of course, if they don't do it themselves, they'll be able to buy it in from someone else if someone else develops it, for example, from Dectris or from RFR. Okay, in the interest of time, I have one last question. Uh, yeah. Would you comment on potential application for cryo EM beyond uh, those used for the drug discovery efforts? Well, it obviously should be used for everything else. Um, I'll tell you one thing that people um, doing biology, cell biology, neurobiology, and they make preparations. It doesn't matter if it's antibodies, it could be vaccines or something like that. They always want to know what is in their specimen. And at the moment they, have, they can do gels, they can do light scattering. So it wouldn't surprise me if, um, cryo-EM is simply used for evaluating your specimen. In other words, is it a homogeneous mixture of one thing? Is it um, a mixture of a hundred things? And then one, I know one or two people in the world are doing this. The idea is you take a cell, you break it open, 
and you don't bother purifying. You just put the whole thing on your grid, take pictures of it, and then you can recognize all the molecules. So you sort them into, you know, all the little ones, all the big ones, all the, the ribosomes and so on and so on, so that you could do by sophisticated image processing, if the images are good enough and you've got enough images, um, you can purify them, you know, you can have a complete cytoplasmic homogenate. Initially, you might need to fractionate it by size. So everything above a million, and you can recognize all the particles, everything between a million and half a million, and then down, down to maybe you know, 40 or 50,000 50, uh, eventually. So, you, you, you know, it'll, be, it'll become a tool and people don't think of it as being specialized. You use it. You measure the pH one day and you measure your cryo-EM structures of everything in your cell the next day. Richard, thank you very much for your lectures and all the answers to all the questions. There are still numerous questions. I encourage those whom I haven't had a chance to read out your questions right directly to Richard. He would answer you uh, uh, of your questions. Again, thank you very much. I'd like to turn the floor back to uh, Bob. Thank you, uh, Wa, and thank you, Richard. Wonderful, fascinating, and uh, we might go back to 100 kV, but I think uh, uh, 300 kV is pretty good uh, in the physical sciences. Perhaps uh, Francis might address that. So I, I'll hand the baton over. I believe that Jen Dion is going to uh, introduce uh, Francis. Maybe uh, at the end uh, we can have so, uh, perhaps you may say a few words uh, uh, after Francis's talk also. Sounds great. Well, uh, thank you, um, you know, Richard for the incredible presentation. Thank you, Bob, also for uh, handing over the floor to me. It is my tremendous honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, someone who has long been a role model for me as I've been learning electron microscopy, Professor Frances Ross. Um, she is the Ellen Swallow Richards Professor in Material Science and Engineering at MIT um, since as of, I believe, two years ago. Um, and she's had an extremely like long and illustrious career in electron microscopy, especially in developing new methods for the physical sciences. Um, she started off her education at Cambridge University where she received her bachelor's degrees in math, natural sciences and physics. And then she went on to receive her PhD also at Cambridge in material science and metallurgy. She then um, started off many years uh, in national labs and industry. She did a postdoc at Bell Labs. She then went to work for the National Center for Electron Microscopy at LBL and spent over 20 years at IBM Yorktown Heights where she pioneered how electron microscopy can be used for crystal growth. Among numerous awards, she's a fellow of the AAAS, the Royal Microscopy Society and Microscopy Society of America. And she was recently awarded the Hashimoto Medal um, at the International Microscopy Congress in 2019, what's often known as the Olympics of Microscopy. Um, and MIT recently wrote an article about her calling her the wizard of ultra sharp imaging. I think that's an accurate description. And Francis, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Let me share my screen. Um, <laughs> we'll try that. How's that look? Good. Um, yeah, looks thanks great. so much for that really fulsome introduction. <laughs> I got to say it's a little bit daunting to follow such a fabulous uh, talk from Richard. Uh, I hope uh, to at least entertain you partly as much as he did. I, I found his uh, talk with the future ideas about microscopy to be really inspiring. So what I'd like to do is um, talk about a, a kind of a narrower area um, about uh, doing microscopy in motion to um, show the joys of uh, looking at, as, at materials as they change. So making videos of things happening, using the information to understand what's going on. And um, the kind of thing I'm gonna talk about is shown in this slide here. So th this first movie shows a catalyst doing its job. It's a gold silicon eutectic liquid droplet uh, sitting on a silicon post. This is a catalyst for growing nanowires. But the fun thing about this movie is you can see a surface structure. Uh, th this is a liquid droplet and the surface of it is a crystalline thin skin 
of uh, gold and silicon. And this has a, obviously a huge impact on the catalytic properties of these kinds of structures. So the second movie shows a uh, little gold triangle sitting on a graphene sheet. And as we warm them up gently, they change shape, but they also start moving around. And you can see they move from place to place. They will turn around in a moment. And uh, the interaction between these 3D materials and a 2D van der Waals bonded layered material is a really interesting way to access new physics. And finally, uh, since many processes happen in water, uh, it's really interesting to watch the physics of fluid motion. This is bubble nucleation growth and motion uh, in water generated actually by the electron beam. So these bubbles are full of hydrogen. I'm not going to talk about liquid cell electron microscopy today just because of uh, time constraints, but um, this is another way to look at the dynamics of small processes and use the information to understand what's going on. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, many collaborators in this area um, from both uh, MIT, where I am now, and IBM, where I had been for a while uh, beforehand. And I especially would like to acknowledge the technical support, right? Most of the stuff you'll see here was done using um, somewhat unusual microscopy uh, hardware and uh, techniques. Actually, the imaging is pretty straightforward. It's the hardware that's unusual. So it's really down to the technical support that makes all of these experiments possible uh, that I'm going to show you. And I'd like to thank uh, many funding agencies who have. Uh, contributed to the, the people involved in, in our work. All right, so uh, why are we interested in watching crystals grow? Well, it's because of a grand challenge in material science. Uh, we really aim in, in doing material science to design and build materials that have particular properties, whether those are electronic or optical, whether they're mechanical, magnetic, or whatever they are. You need to be able to uh, specify what you'd like and then build the material that can do that job for you. So nanoscience provides new tools for achieving this goal. Um, because shrinking the size of the material often unlocks new properties. So I'm showing you here two uh, images of things that are on the nano, at least micro scale, and they've, they're done using very different philosophies. Um, in the first one, you can see that we are, that this is actually from some colleagues at IBM, moving atoms into place one at a time. And so this is the world's tiniest um, stable magnetic bit. It's made of 12 iron atoms that were moved into place one at a time using the tip of an STM. So this is a fabulous thing. Uh, and of course, uh, we'd all love to do this, but it's too slow for real life. So here's our second choice, uh, self-assembly, uh, a spontaneous process where you can see we're getting all sorts of little structures all at once. These raindrops on our building window are controlled obviously by physics, by the surface tension of the droplets, by a little inhomogeneities on the surface that determine where they nucleate. So we have simple structures that form all together very easily in parallel compared to making one or two complicated things one at a time. So here's the trouble. Uh, this is a complex structure. This is a simple one. Can we use simple methods of self-assembly to build structures that are very complicated? And so this is where in situ electron microscopy comes in. If we can image these self-assembly processes while they take place, this gives us a powerful way to understand the physics of what's going on and therefore to control the process that we're looking at. So nanowire growth is the first thing I'll talk about. And after that, I'll speak about growth of um, materials on 2D van der Waals bonded surfaces uh, to give a little flavor of some of the things that you can do with uh, in situ electron microscopy as crystals grow. So the, the, the process by which nanowire growth takes place was uh, first uh, explained in the literature in the 60s. So the vapor liquid solid mechanism is shown as what you might call PowerPoint science, right? So a lot of nanoscience, you can't see it directly with the, you know, with your eyes. So you tend to write it down in an idealized way on a PowerPoint slide and say, yes, this must be what's happening. So in this case, uh, what happens is you put gold on a silicon surface, you warm up the pair of this, this combination of materials. Gold and silicon uh, interact to form a eutectic at quite a low temperature, 370 degrees. Um, the eutectic de-wets off the surface and you get little droplets of gold silicon. And then the trick is to supply more silicon, for example, using disilane. This is a reactive gas that when it hits the 
the heated surface, it decomposes, the hydrogen goes away, and the silicon then uh, diffuses through the gold silicon liquid, and it uh, precipitates at the interface between the droplet and the substrate. If it could grow in a perfect silicon crystal, then you would get a post of silicon growing as the longer you do this process. So that's PowerPoint science. In real life, uh, this, is, this is how it works. Um, and it works actually pretty well. Uh, so you can see here a single crystal of silicon growing. The dark lines are thickness fringes. Look at the structure on the side walls. Do you see that zigzag structure? This is actually driven by gold migration on the surface. And you can see the growth taking place. We can measure the uh, properties of the growth uh, in order to understand what, for example, are the rate limiting steps and what are the details. Right, so uh, this is how these kinds of experiments are, uh, are achieved. And I'm not gonna only show uh, data from this microscope, but this is the microscope that generated a, a majority of the data that I'm going to show you today. So this gives an example of a an in situ microscope that's adapted for these experiments. It's a it's a Hitachi UHV microscope, so customized to get ultra high vacuum in the 10 to minus 10 tor regime at the um, sample, which by the way is about a thousand times better than commercial uh, uh, standard microscope vacuum. Uh, we have a gas dosing system to feed the reactive gases. Uh, we can put fairly toxic ones in there like arsine or phosphine. Um, so thanks to our safety team for making that all work out. We have a transferable cartridge that can go between the microscope and several other chambers where you can do, for example, temperature calibration, patterning using a built-in um, focused ion beam uh, source and uh, various depositions uh, using evaporators. So this is all under UHV, it's connected to the microscope. And look at the, <laughs> the vintage of some of the electronics here. This is an old instrument, but it still works and it works really well. So to grow nanowires, we want to see them growing um, we want to look parallel to the plane of the growth. So let's make them grow out sideways by having our sample be a little strip of silicon with the polished surface mounted vertically. It's a 111 crystal surface. And so the nanowires grow in that direction and they grow perpendicular to the surface. We can see them very straightforwardly. So this is heated by direct current uh, once it's mounted in the uh, sample holder here. All right, so that's how the experiments are done. And I want to show you some of the, um, of course we can measure the phase, the growth interface morphology, uh, the, the kinetics as a function of pressure and temperature, the uh, defects, the surface structure, and we can use this to match with growth models. So to, so to illustrate the kind of power of these uh, observations, I'm gonna show you the same nanowire growth taking place in uh, in a higher resolution microscope, this is at the ETEM in Brookhaven National Lab. And if you look carefully, you can see the individual layers of silicon, actually bilayers of silicon, uh, adding onto the growth interface. And what you see is a kind of a pulsing uh, dynamics, right? So you can see that uh, it's even though we're supplying the material at a constant rate, the growth is a little jumpy. So let me cut out the central piece of this movie and play it here and look very carefully. There was a, a layer just grew. And if we wait and we wait and we wait, and we wait, come on, come on, there it goes. Did you see that? So another complete layer formed all at once. So this kind of growth is in great contrast with other growth modes. This next movie shows the growth of gallium arsenide from arsine and trimethyl gallium. You can hardly see the catalyst in this dark field um, uh, image. But what you can see is that the steps flow gently across the surface. So we get similar catalyst, similar kinetics with a, with a gentle progressive step flow for solid catalysts and for low solubility uh, uh, growth experiments like uh, arsenic in, um, in, in gold. Uh, so we get different kinds of kinetics that we can observe in real time in the microscope. We can do some fairly um, you know, intuitive modeling of these things to say what's going on during growth. So uh, just to, um, to show these uh, briefly, uh, silicon, as I said, arrives at the catalyst surface at a steady rate as it's supplied from the gas phase. And it has to decide, should it stay in solution or should it precipitate at the interface? So we can distinguish two cases. Supposing the catalyst has very low solubility for the growth species. 
So let's say the silicon arrives and it really has a, by which I mean uh, the energetics of having a lot of silicon in the solid catalyst is unfavorable. Silicon doesn't want to be there. As soon as it arrives, it has to precipitate. The step flow is therefore continuous. All right. Now, supposing the solubility is actually quite high as it would be in a liquid gold silicon droplet. The silicon arrives, it easily remains in solution, but as more and more silicon uh, arrives and enters the droplet, the chemical potential of silicon in this uh, liquid gets higher and higher and eventually it becomes energetically favorable to nucleate a step. But then there's so much silicon in solution that all this extra silicon can now easily attach to a step edge because it's easier to attach to an existing step edge than it is to create the nucleus in the first place. And that generates the kinetics we saw, a waiting time and then a rapid step flow. And this type of modeling informs our understanding of how to grow nanowires with particular structures. So in uh, growing nanowires, it's all very well to show a perfect silicon prism being grown, but uh, that's not actually that much use in electronics. What we would really like to do is grow a nanowire with a quantum dot inside it, so an interface between materials. We do that by um, flowing the gas, growing the silicon, switching the gas, to dye germane and then growing a little bit of germanium and then switching back to silicon and growing a little bit more silicon. So what we end up with a, a quantum well of germanium within the nanowire. Um, and this is the PowerPoint science. It works to some extent and the uh, considerations I showed you on the previous slide suggest that a solid catalyst with low uh, solubility for the growth species is best for sharp interfaces because you don't have a whole reservoir of material of the first material still in the catalyst at the time when you grow the second one. However, um, I want to I'm showing this mostly because it illustrates one of the things that we all enjoy about doing in situ microscopy, which is that you often see things that you had no idea were even possible. And you look back at them and say, oh, of course, that must have been how it happened. But unless you had seen it in real life, you wouldn't really believe, you wouldn't have even gone down that pathway. So this is one of the experiments along those lines. We decided that we wanted to grow a silicon and then, uh, and then nickel silicide interface, because nickel disilicide is a material often used in, um, in the uh, interconnects in integrated circuits. So we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we could grow the silicon nanowire with a nickel disilicide layer within it? And so we added the nickel, expecting to see these layers of nickel disilicide forming. But instead, what we saw in the movie was the formation of this thing within the catalyst. This little perfect octahedral crystal formed in the catalyst, floated around a bit, eventually stuck down on the interface. And then we switched back to silicon. We continue to grow more silicon. It surrounds this little crystal. Uh, at this point, it looks a bit like a uh, an ice cube floating in a drink, but you can keep growing and it completely embed it. So we're seeing this kind of science instead of the first layer by layer um, uh, growth process, we're seeing the formation of a little uh, crystallite, which then be, can be embedded within a nanowire. So the catalyst really is acting as a mixing bowl to collect up other materials and dump them in some form onto the growth front. So I want to uh, move on from nanowires, but I don't want to leave you with, with the impression that it all, you know, it's all happy, happy, it always works all the time. So I want to just uh, use this, this slide to show you some of the entertaining things that didn't work out so well. Um, if the vacuum is poor, probably a bit like uh, in the early days of cryomicroscopy, you can see this junk forming on the surface. That's because <clears throat> we're flowing reactive gases that contain silicon. We've got oxygen or water in there, and uh, we've got uh, electron beam effects that contribute to this kind of layer, which prevents growth completely by blocking the surface. Sometimes you get bizarre morphologies. Sometimes you get kinks in the nanowire caused by odd nucleation of the uh, of, at a heterojunction. And often you get motion of the nanowire, uh, of the catalyst on the end of the nanowire, that results in the death of the catalyst and the end of the nanowire. Look at what's happening here. And what's driving this is Ostwald ripening. Uh, the gold atoms in the catalyst here are diffusing along the surface of the nanowire across the 
the surface of the sample and then up to some other nanowire whose catalyst may may even grow a bit larger. So this seemed like a real problem, although it turned out to be quite interesting in terms of understanding the limitations on nanowire growth. All right, so, um, so nanowire growth gives us a hint about how looking in the microscope at a self-assembly process can help us understand the mechanism of the process and thereby control a feature of the result like the tapering or the sharpness of an interface within the structure. So um, what we'd like to do is extend this to a wider range of materials systems and something that you can hardly fail to be in, enchanted with is the uh, extreme developments in, in two-dimensional Van der Waals bonded layered materials. This is a truly exciting area of nanoscience because the um, control of the structures uh, in, in these materials can uh, generate properties such as superconductivity um, by uh, superimposing different length scales in the same material. So we have the very short length scale in the vertical direction. We have the atomic scale of the unit cells within each layer. But if you twist two materials, as shown here in this well-known uh, image, you get a moiré pattern that gives even a different uh, periodicity in plane. And this is what leads to um, much of the new physics and functionality of these uh, heterostructured 2D materials. All right, so moray patterns are, <coughs> are marvelous, um, but how about morays at interfaces between 2D and 3D materials? So I'm talking now about not putting two layered materials together and twisting them, but instead putting a 3D conventionally bonded material on top of a 2D material. So here's a classic example of such, uh, such a combination, a uh, gold deposited on MOS2. So the MOS2 has, uh, uh, you know, Van der Waals bonded surface, uh, the gold, of course, uh, metallic bonding. What happens when these two very dissimilar materials are forced to come into into uh, contact with each other. So we do this, uh, so, so when we deposit gold on the MOS2, we can image in different uh, modes. This is um, STEM IDPC mode, um, conventional STEM, and this is high resolution TEM. And you can see that there's a Mori pattern generated here, very beautiful one, and this case, in fact, generated by the mismatch in lattice uh, spacing between the two materials. All right. So to do these experiments, we can use the same type of experimental um, setup, but instead of using these blocks of silicon as substrates, we use 2D materials that are transferred over holy silicon nitride and then cleaned and deposited under UHV. So this can all be done in UHV uh, with the sample prep done and then transferred directly to the microscope for heating experiments or other observations. All right. So. Um, so one, so the first thing we notice is that a, a very clean surface is critical, and that's because the bonding is so weak. There's no, you know, the gold doesn't really want to bond with the MOS2. So any excuse, any piece of dirt, any contamination will lead to polycrystalline disorganized deposition of gold. But once you clean it up by annealing in vacuum and maintaining a good vacuum, we get very beautiful images showing the moiré patterns that I, I, I showed you in the previous slide. And you can go thicker and almost and get a, a continuous film uh, where every pretty much every one of these nuclei is, is epitaxial. And so when they merge, the, uh, the, the, there aren't high angle grain boundaries. So we were pretty pleased with ourselves for generating these pictures until we started looking back in the literature a little bit. And I think it's a good uh, opportunity to mention pioneering work from the past. Look at the dates on, on this paper from the uh, Takinagi's group. Um, this was done using a UHV uh, Joel instrument uh, way back in the 70s, and you can see exactly the same kind of thing. This is a movie uh, showing the recorded during the deposition of gold on molybdenite, which was uh, the name of MOS2 before people started thinking 2D materials. Okay, anyway, so the bonding is very weak, as you can see uh, in this uh, series of STEM images. There's small motions of the gold at uh, islands, even at room temperature. Uh, we're not heating it, uh, we're just, uh, the electron beam at 60 kV is enough to create some small motion of the uh, of the islands that shows up in the, in the moiré patterns. And if you heat up 
the um, sample a little bit higher, still in UHV, uh, you get the motions that I described uh, in the first slide of this talk. Right. Okay, so um, an interesting feature of these is that if we measure with TEM, we get a Moray periodicity of about two angstroms, uh, 1 uh, one point eight nanometers. Sorry, one point eight nanometers here. And um, if we measured the same material using STM, um, this happens to be MOS two deposit deposited on gold, but the, uh, the 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 result is the same whichever way around you do it. Um, the STM period is larger, so um, the the answer to this discrepancy is somehow obvious in retrospect, but it's one of those things that takes a long time to figure out. And the answer, the reason that there's a discrepancy is because the gold is a 3D structure, right? So uh, if we simply um, considered a single 111 plane of gold, um, which is shown in orange here, um, and it's superimposed on an MOS2 um, uh, uh, monolayer, you would get the 3.2 nanometer more repeat distance. But since you have all three of the gold uh, layers, the ABC stacking of the FCC structure of the gold, uh, when superimposed in projection, we get a much smaller pattern uh, of only 1.8 uh, nan nanometers. And the relationship between the two is that um, here you can see here the, the sort of uh, harmonic uh, of the smaller pattern makes up the larger pattern. So the fact that the 3D structure in projection has a different symmetry from the layer of the 3D structure that, that touches the 2D material is the reason why an electronic measurement like in STM is different from a, a projection method like in TEM. So uh, what this means is that uh, interfaces between 2D and 3D materials provide some exciting opportunities for tuning properties, but um, you have to be a little, just because you have that third dimension to uh, to play with, but you have to be a little careful when you're interpreting the data from TEM because of the projection effects and you have to um, make sure you do imaging that can get around that limitation. So, so um, we'd like to continue looking at 2D, 3D interfaces, but do it, do it with a slightly more general um, objective here, because beyond Moray phenomena, uh, any 2D material that's used in an electronic device has to be connected to the three-dimensional world. And it's pretty well known that if you can make that junction uh, lower defect density, more well organized, more uniform, you can get better properties, for example, in charge transfer through the interfaces or in induced properties like uh, proximity effects, proximity induced superconductivity. So uh, we'd like in general to figure out ways to grow epitaxial 3D materials onto van der Waals bonded um, layered 2D materials. And so what we find in doing this is that nanowire growth physics can give us some hints that are useful and that there's a way to transfer epitaxy that helps extend the material's properties. So I'll show you these results um, in a couple of slides here. Um, I showed you that gold loves to grow triangles on MOS2 if you give it the opportunity, but germanium grows rather poorly. Um, and here's an example on graphene where we get polycrystalline lumps of germanium when we do chemical vapor deposition. So instead, let's use solid gold to grow the germanium. So in this movie, which honestly is not the most exciting one we ever recorded, I want you to look very carefully at these corners here first and then here. Uh, so here's the gold triangle. It's at the growth conditions for germanium. It's about 200 degrees C. We're flowing digermane. Let's go for it. Look carefully at that triangle there. Did you see that exciting stuff? And another one is going to happen just here, just here. Wait for it. Yes, there it is. All right. So it's a very slow experiment because the temperature is so low, uh, but we have to keep the temperature low in order for the catalyst to be solid rather than a liquid. And if we wait for some time, we do indeed get epitaxy. So what's happening is the uh, substrate, this, the graphene is giving its epitaxial orientation to the gold and the gold is giving its epitaxial orientation to the germanium, even though the graphene and the germanium would not have communicated well 
uh, in the absence of the gold. And so the result can be something that looks very much like a nanowire as the germanium is deposited at this interface, pushes the gold ahead of it, um, and then grows as a single crystal with good orientation on the substrate. So how about doing this for silicon? We need a solid catalyst to grow silicon nanowires, and we do indeed need such, uh, we do indeed know of such a catalyst. Uh, silver is a good one. Um, and um, silver gold alloys also work. Uh, we need, we can't use gold because gold would work at such a, a, a low temperature that the growth would be uh, impractically slow because disilane doesn't crack efficiently at low temperatures. So let's take this knowledge of silver and gold as catalysts and apply that to growing silicon. So we start by putting silver on the graphene substrate, but silver doesn't grow epitaxial on graphene. So the silicon isn't epitaxial either. So instead we firstly grow the gold triangles we then grow silver around them and it adopts the gold's uh, orientation. And then we use this combined catalyst to grow silicon and we get epitaxy. So now we have transfer through a couple of different links. Uh, the graphene talks to the gold, the gold talks to the silver, the silver talks to the silicon. And so the si silicon is lined up with the interface. Okay, so we can expand to a little bit of, of other materials. We want to grow other semiconductors. Here's an example of growing gallium arsenide from gallium droplets. And this is an interesting one because uh, liquid droplets didn't work so well for, for silicon and germanium, but they seem to work quite well for gallium arsenide that we can get nuclei of gallium arsenide forming within the gallium liquid. And um, so we can use our nanowire experience to grow all kinds of bizarre little things within the droplets, as I showed you before, the case of the nickel disilicide octahedral crystals. We could imagine doing these kinds of things in droplets that were not on the ends of nanowires, but were sitting on a 2D material. And I, I got to show you this picture. It shows as these things start to form, you can see them rattling around, looking for good orientation to stick down and start growing. And eventually they settle down and uh, continue to grow. Okay, so for the last minute or so, I'd like to talk about what might happen next. Um, and I, I was, uh, it was really, fun to hear Richard talking about the importance of the vacuum in cryo microscopy. So in material science, I'm utterly convinced that this is the key for the next step, at least for these experiments, because control of the environment is important for creating the, the, the clean surfaces in the first place and for keeping them clean over the time frame at which you do the experiment. It has all kinds of benefits, including reducing side reactions between the gases in the uh, environment and the ones that you actually want to flow. Um, and it um, also allows for observations of materials that would otherwise react with air like oxidize before they could be imaged. So these images show niobium growing on um, graphene uh, these are dendritic types of structures because the growth temperature is not quite high enough, but you can see they're highly epitaxial on the, uh, on the substrate. They, they make very beautiful diffraction patterns where you have the graphene and the niobium spots in, uh, in, in good alignment with each other. So these need to be done. This experiment needs UHV to make it work. But UHV has another benefit. As I said at the start, the bonding is so weak that any kind of a defect will create nucleation. So if the surface is clean, we have a better chance at controlling nucleation. Um, if the surface is then well controlled, we can deliberately introduce new sites for um, nucleation that will give us arrays of little triangles. Uh, along the lines that are shown here, this is done with a focused iron beam, uh, make, this actually drilling little holes, which are quite sort of um, significant disruptions of the substrate. But with lower doses, you can just make a small collection of point defects that would be a, a good uh, opportunity for these gold triangles to nucleate and therefore be able to form arrays with, with uh, for example, photonic uh, applications. So let me conclude um, by saying that I feel that we're in a really interesting time for this type of microscopy. Uh, there are developments in imaging tools, um, and there's also the need for new growth techniques 
whereby we understand uh, self-assembly well enough to create quite complicated structures where the size, the shape, the composition, the epitaxial arrangement of two of, a, of nanoscale volumes of materials are well controlled. So to make these designer nanostructures uh, with the highest level of pre precision using simple scalable growth like self-assembly, we need to use the developments and imaging tools that are going on. The uh, aberration correction, low voltage operation for beam sensitive materials, efficient and fast detectors, uh, the control of sample, uh, you know, stimuli using MEMS technology, and uh, in, in, at least in our case, UHV environment for improved control. So although in some cases quantification remains a challenge, I think this is an excellent uh, situation to be in to generate some interesting new physics to help us uh, control uh, nanoscale crystals. So thanks very much for your attention. Great, thank you so much. That was an outstanding presentation. Um, I think Rafael was instructing people to uh, address questions um, in in the chat, and it looks like uh, one of the first questions is, um, "What suggestions would you have on uh, avoiding, you know, various beam effects? Like, what are the you know, controls that you're using, especially, you know, for some of the more delicate samples, like the oh. two dimensional materials?" All right. Well, that's a great question because we have a pioneer of this whole thing on the organizing uh, committee here. So uh, Bob Sinclair, as, as I hope all of you know, um, developed a set of uh, procedures for doing in situ microscopy, which is common to all of these experiments, that you have to look, you, so you've made your movie. Of course, you can make the movie with different uh, beam intensities and use that in information to see if the beam is making an obvious difference as you turn it up. Uh, you can look somewhere else that the beam never struck and um, you can also do some theoretical uh, calculations to see what you would expect. What could be, could there be a safe dose? So for example, in analyzing uh, liquids, um, it, the radiolysis effects are pretty strong and it's possible to calculate what you would expect the change in chemistry to be when you irradiate the sample. So you have to adopt a lot of these uh, types of um, kind of sanity checks when you do all of these experiments. The fact that we can now get good resolution at, for, at, at voltages low enough to avoid knock-on damage for the 2D materials is a really significant step forward that makes a lot of this stuff possible. Okay. <laughs> cool, that's that's great. Maybe a follow-up question to that, like, you know, uh, what do you imagine as like the uh, intersection between um, the electron microscopy and, uh, you know, machine learning and convolutional neural nets to kind of understand, for example, how defects are performing in, you know, a three-dimensional matrix. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, that's a fabulous area. There's a, a good number of people involved in that. I think there's even a workshop going on at Oak Ridge even now as we speak in, in this area. So you can maybe uh, <clears throat> tune into that um, afterwards, but um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. It allows um, a lot of data you know, with movies, we're collecting so much data, it's hard to analyze in practical uh, time frames without some kind of machine learning to show which are the important uh, features in, in these many images. So I think that with, um, it's been less of a, of a limitation for what we're doing because we maybe are looking at an individual object as it grows and trying to track that one. Um, but certainly in terms of what defects create nucleation sites, how effective are they, um, and how? what are the kind of small statistical variations in growth that you get in any self-assembly process, however well controlled. I think that having the computer and, and the newly improving, the ever improving algorithms to help us analyze this data is an absolutely central area for future progress in this kind of thing. Right. <laughs> Um, there's another question um, that actually is very near and dear to my heart, but I'd love to hear your answers. Um, they're, they're interested in catalysis and in particular um, plasmon catalysis and wondering, um, you know, to what extent could you or others have used uh, in situ electron energy loss spectroscopy to understand some of those catalytic processes? Okay, so um, I am not qualified to talk much about the, the analytical side of things because 
I mostly do really low tech, you know, bright field, dark field imaging, some high res imaging. Um, this is definitely the, the next step uh, with the brighter sources, the, the, um, the improved optics. I, I think it, it's becoming feasible to see the chemical uh, signatures of catalytic processes. You'll notice that we got around this issue by doing a catalytic process nanowire growth that creates a solid product. So you can actually see as each atom or, la or let's say layer of atoms nucleates and grows, uh, the, cat the catalyst is leaving a trail behind that shows its activity. I feel like um, with more um, uh, you know, common catalysts with gas phase reactions with less of a distinctive signature, you can still um, expect to get really helpful information using energy loss spectroscopy. And I, I feel like uh, with everything else, we're at this cusp of a, a real improvements in the hardware that will allow it to be done. So we have the, the, the issue with these time resolved experiments that you need to get that information that maybe would have taken a long time just in a static sense. You, you really want to have that for every single frame of a movie. So you're pushing hard on the dose uh, tolerance of the sample and the process and the calibrations that, that you could do on in terms of the local temperatures. But definitely the, there's a lot of good work going on in this field. And I think this is a, a really uh, useful area to, to be in, exciting area. Make those movies in color. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Maybe one final question from another audience uh, member, which is, uh, you know, uh, long term, you know, studying, you know, in situ protein crystal growth, like uh, how far away do you think the field is from that? Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, so I'm sure Richard will have a stronger opinion on this one. I think that liquid, so, so studying these things in liquid cell microscopy gives you a different view compared to doing it in cryo microscopy, because of course the object is at room temperature, it's still in water. In principle, you can have some, some biological system that's still alive and functioning at the time you start imaging it. Um, radiolysis effects are different in water compared to ice, so you have to balance those two things. But there are such uh, immense uh, steps forwards in designing liquid cell uh, experiments to improve the, 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 the information that they can yield. In particular, going um, maybe moving on from the conventional uh, silicon nitride window cells that, that gave a you know, a, a, a lowish resolution at the start, all the way to using 2D materials in a way that still enables the, um, the liquid to be controlled and placed where you want it and maybe even exchanged by flow. So I think that uh, this area seems to be evolving very quickly um, and it, it suffers a bit from, we need a really strong understanding of radiolysis effects. Um, we need to fight because we're, we're using a strong dose. We're fighting against the low contrast of these materials in water against with including the, the windows in the um, liquid cell. So it's a, it's a very challenging um, area, but if we can be sure that we're imaging something that has the true structure um, in the water, if we can do it fast enough to avoid getting too confused by motion, then maybe by doing variable temperature up and down uh, and looking at the differences there. So I think liquid cell microscopy at kind of temperatures near freezing, uh, I think I think the, the opportunities here are fabulous as well. So Great. we'd like to do it all, right? So, so I know. people out there, go, go and do it, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I know Yi had a question, so I wanna give him a chance to ask. Hi, Francis. Uh, really fascinating uh, new data on the 2D moray pattern. So I have a question related to your uh, the really exciting stuff, the graphene, gold, silver, and silicon. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know gold and silver came from alloy with uh, all, the, all the composition range. Sounds like your gold and silver does not form the alloy. So is it because of graphene, you know, change the behavior? Is it because of temperature is not high enough? So what's the reason behind? Um, yeah, this, this is something that we're looking into. So when we deposit the, the gold and get these epitaxial structures, the temperature at the substrate is really, uh, it's, it's not deliberately heated. It's probably about 120 degrees C. So at this point, the gold has enough mobility to form 
nuclei to diffuse to make uh, to make properly shaped crystals. Um, but that's about it. If we add silver at a sim similar temperature, we don't see a whole lot of interdiffusion at the interface. We get a conformal covering of the gold island with a silver island that grows up and outwards. When we heat, when we do the, the nanowire growth, the temperature is still only 200 degrees. Uh, maybe 250 or 300 degrees C. It's not really enough to get a lot of dynamics going on, but after some time there is interdiffusion. So we would uh, expect that you can control by temperature uh, exactly the degree of interdiffusion between the, the two materials in these composite islands. So that, that will be an interesting uh, thing to, to record at high resolution. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know we're at the top of the hour. And, uh, you know, as Wa mentioned with Richard, I'm sure Francis would be delighted to take any of the remaining questions in the chat, you know, by email or respond to any questions that those of you have offline. So thank you so much, Francis. That was a really inspiring presentation. Well, thank, you. thank you for the opportunity. That was, that was great. <laughs> cool. and Bob, I'll hand the floor back to you. Okay. Thank you, Jen. So, uh, I think that uh, our panelists and, and ourselves will stay on the line uh, after the recording will finish. But I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Richard and Francis for doing two ins really inspiring talks today. And of course, uh, uh, our support group uh, to make the infrastructure of this uh, seminar uh, really work. Uh, the next uh, one will be in the first Monday of the new year and Jen Dion and Joaquin Frank will be our speakers that day. So this will hopefully get the new year off to a, a great start and an inspiring start after the difficulties we've had in the current year. I think uh, before we uh, finish the, rec the recording and uh, go over to an informal session, then I'd like to, of course, send my best wishes to uh, the many cultures who are watching for whom it will be the holiday season. And I hope that you stay, stay safe and well uh, and uh, enjoy the time off with your families. Uh, and of course, uh, continue to do electron microscopy uh, in the meantime. So thank you again, and we'll see you in the new year on January the 4th. So we can finish the recording and then uh, uh, we can chat informally afterwards. Thank you.